When you think of an English accent, what do you think of? This? I'm speaking to you at what I know is an increasingly challenging time. Ah, the Queen's English, spoken by pretty much just the Queen. Okay, how about this? Oh, what, right, ladies and gents? Dick Van Dyke, Hollywood's version of a London Cockney accent. To be honest, it's as authentic as a nine pound note. See, when I think of an English accent, I think of this. Notice that I said Toronto and not Toronto. All right, I've got three pronunciation features of the Australian accent to share. So we don't say father, mother, we say father, mother, sister. You might know that India is a multilingual, multicultural country. With a Jersey accent from the north, we don't say ah, it becomes more or. English is spoken by roughly 1.3 billion people, the majority of which are non-native speakers. Linguist David Crystal estimates that the ratio is roughly 3 to 1. English doesn't just belong to the Queen, it belongs to anyone that speaks it. Now accents are a wonderful part of language and they can vary so much. Someone's accent can depend on where they're from, their socioeconomic background, their age, their race or ethnicity, their cultural influences and so much more. Now this video is a celebration of the sheer variety of English accents around the world. Now I've invited some awesome people to teach you a little bit about their accent. They'll give you a little bit of background information and then they'll teach us a few pronunciation features so that we can identify identify their accents more easily. Now this is a big video guys, so feel free to skip to the parts that you're most interested in. Hey there, I'm Emma from the mm English YouTube channel. I'm also from Australia. And here we don't have the regional dialects that are so prominent in the UK and the US. It's actually quite hard to pick from where within Australia an Australian is from. There is definitely a more pronounced posh Australian accent and a more broad um, ochre Australian accent, which is the one that you'll recognize from movies and, and you know, it's always poorly done by non-Australian English speakers. But that difference uh, in those two accents or dialects is not really based on geography, it's more based on social circles and culture. All right, I've got three pronunciation features of the Australian accent to share. One we share in common with British English, the other with American English, and one is distinctly Australian. I'll let you guess which one is which. But first up, we don't pronounce the er, r sound at the end of words like teacher, blister, weather. So that final sound is a schwa, the er is silent. Unless the word following starts with a vowel and then the er sound becomes a linking sound. Power up becomes power up, power up. Second, we usually use the flap T between vowels and that means that the T sound sounds more like a D. Water, butter, leather, got it? Now, the Australian accent is really defined by its vowels and it's often referred to as a drawl. It's not the most flattering of, of words or pronunciation types at all. But most distinct, I think, is the O vowel sound, the diphthong sound, O. This is the sound that I can detect in any of my non-native speaking English students. Um, I can hear that O oh, if they've spent any time in Australia. Um, and you can hear it in really, really common words like go, soap, though, so often, right? But it's distinctly Australian, that pronunciation. So if you would like to hear more Australian English pronunciation or learn a little bit more about it, check out the mm English YouTube channel. See you there. Thank you, Emma, for that expert analysis. I've always thought there was a commonality between British English accents and Australian English accents. I guess that could be no surprise given the historical links. That flat T that Emma picked out is such a distinctive feature of Australian English accents. I have a friend from Sheffield who moved out to Australia who retains his strong Yorkshire accent, except for that flat T when he says water and daughter. Okay, let's move on to our next accent. Hello, my name is Kayla, or I'm also known as Teacher K from Diaspora English Learning. And what you're hearing right now 
is a Canadian accent. Actually, it is one of many Canadian accents because people sound different in different parts of the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast to the Prairies to Quebec and Ontario. And even within cities, you will hear a lot of variety in people's accents and their way of speaking English because Canada and Canadians are extremely multilingual and multicultural. So depending on a person's linguistic or cultural background, their variety of English may differ a little bit. But there are some aspects of English in Canada that span across all the varieties and that are unique to Canada. My accent specifically is from the greater Toronto area. Notice that I said Toronto and not Toronto. That's a feature of Canadian English. We, for T's that are not stressed, they end up sounding more like an N. Like for example, 20 instead of 20. Toronto instead of Toronto. And enter instead of enter. Okay, this is a feature. Another thing that's unique to Canadian English is the way we say our vowels. We rarely say our vowels in the back of our throat. A lot of times it's more nasal compared to American varieties of English. For example, Canadians say sorry and Americans say sorry. It's a small difference, but it's something that makes Canadians stand out. The way we pronounce the vowel A in some words is also different from um, is also different. For example, in Canada we say pasta instead of pasta, mantra instead of mantra, for example. And last but not least, we have this word a that we use as a question tag, as an interjection, um, in between co after comments and exclamations. This you will hear all over the country, this word a. Hey guys, I'm Catherine. I'm a Canadian living in London, UK. I was born in China and my first language is French. So I'm here to talk to you about the French Canadian English accent. You might have come across someone. They will sound, let's say, North American, a bit like me right now, but there's something else behind. You might be tempted to say French, but uh, they don't sound like the French from France, correct? That's because they might be from Quebec province, which is on the eastern coast of Canada. French is the official language of Quebec. Put simply, it goes back to when New France was the area colonized by France in North America, and then under the British rule, Quebec French got isolated from European French, and both languages' phonetics and speech patterns evolved differently. Quebec is home to 8 million people, and French is the native tongue for 78% of the population, so that will often influence our accent. Let's explore some of the common features to recognize it. Let's actually have a look with one of our greatest ambassadors, Céline Dion, or Céline Dion. And the makeup, and the jewelry, and the clothing that I love so much, and, and pretending, and like dramatic, and oh my goodness, oh, oh, oh. I love all that. And I really wanted to show as well, you know, we borrow um, characters, mm. we're on stage. So her accent is not that prominent, but in some words, her consonant sounds are stronger. Jewelry. Jewelry. Like dramatic. Dramatic. Borrow. Borrow. That strong R sound, right? Right? Let's have a look at another shirt example. You've been married, what, 20 years now, to Hey, 20 years? My husband, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you notice she said husband instead of husband? It's actually been really tough to find a video of her with that feature because, you know, she's been singing My Heart Will Go On for ages now. But this is actually super common for us French Canadians. The H sound alone is silent in French, so we often just drop it in English. And it will lead to things like Hello, Hot, Happy, History. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed um, this overview of French Canadian English. Thank you, Teacher K and Catherine, for your breakdown of Canadian English accent. I didn't know about the nasal realizations of vowels like sorry, um, but when I think about it, one of my favorite TV shows on Netflix is Working Mums, and that's set in Toronto. And when I when I sort of think about it, like, oh yeah, they have that same sound in the show. So really interesting to find these uh, pronunciation features in pop culture. 
And Catherine's analysis of how French has influenced the English in Quebec was fascinating. That dropped H is actually so common in British English accents as well. We've got it in Mancunian, Cockney and Brummie. Okay, let's get to the Irish accent. So I'm Diane and I'm going to talk to you about the Irish accent. Well, okay, no, that's kind of wrong right out the gates. There is no one Irish accent. In fact, Ireland has the most accents per capita of anywhere in the world. From one side of the city to the other, you'll find two completely different accents. Take Dublin, for example. I have a South Dublin accent because I'm from the south side of Dublin. On the north side of Dublin, you'll find people have a much thicker accent. For example, Colin Farrell is from the north side of Dublin and his accent is just a wee bit thicker. And who gets into hell and all that? The Irish accent is more commonly referred to as a brogue and it's probably the accent people most complain about people getting wrong in films. I'm going to say that's because they attempt to do an Irish accent and they don't pick a specific place. If they were, a good place to start might be one of the four provinces, Leinster, Ulster, Munster and Connacht. Now, each of those provinces have hundreds of different accents among them, but they share commonalities within them. For example, take your classic Northern Irish Belfast accent. While I from the capital city might say cow, now, how, in Northern Ireland they use a much smaller mouth and they go cow, now, hi. But say you fly across to the west of Ireland, you will find Cork, which has a completely different accent altogether. Very sing-songy, very charming. What I'm getting at is we all sound completely different wherever you are, but there are a few things we have in common. Let's go back to the words YouTube. Word. Is that one word or two words? It's a hyphen. No, it's not. So while I'm aware the correct pronunciation of YouTube is you tube, in Ireland we say tube. You tube. The biggest thing you'll notice about Irish people is that we often get rid of our THs. For example, the word three. You might hear us say tree. Some of us actually are saying the TH, but we're saying it so quickly and lightly that you can barely hear it. One, two, three. We like to drop the ends of words. We're quite lazy. Walking, talking, thinking. And then there's the letter or. We say or very pronounced or are, depending on where you are in the world. Are butter. When it comes to vowels, we tend to soften those. So while maybe you should say, how are you? I would just say, how are you? And of course, we are accused frequently of speaking very fast, but that's a matter of opinion. I think it's just because we have a lot of slang terms that people outside of Ireland might not be familiar with. And of course, I couldn't do this video without mentioning the word potato. Yeah, potato. And that's the Irish accent. If you want to know more about slang terms and Irish accents and all things Irish, check out my YouTube channel, Diane Jennings. Bye. Cheers, Diane, for that whirlwind tour of Irish accents. What I find most fascinating is that even in a relatively small city like Dublin, you can have two completely different accents that's not just based on a class divide, but also on a geographical divide like the River Liffey. Fascinating. Right, let's head across the other side of the world. To Singapore. Hello everyone, my name is Trav New. I am a Singaporean Chinese actor and yoga teacher based in London. So I'm here to talk to you about a Singaporean accent today, leaving aside what Singlish is, which is a whole new different topic. So the Singaporean accent, we tend to extend the last vowel of the words that we are saying in a sentence and we tend to put pauses in between a lot of different words for no reason because it's just how the way we speak. I think it has a lot of influence from Chinese and how it's like. And maybe sometimes when we are speaking, uh, we are some of us are translating from Chinese to English in our head. So creating a lot of random pauses here and there. Uh, that's how we speak. And also we don't really have THs in our English. So we don't say father, mother. We say father, mother, sister. Uh, yeah, and I mean, there are many different types of Singaporean accent anyways. So sometimes some people would sound a little bit more American if they want to seem like they've went to a really nice posh school with American teachers. Or, you know, sometimes um, they have a little bit of Malay accent or Indian accent or Chinese accent influenced in the way they speak. So if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me a message on Instagram and my handle is at trevneo i'll talk to you again soon bye bye
Thanks Trio for an excellent summary of Singaporean English. It's such a multicultural place and each community seems to leave its own mark on the accent. Okay, let's continue east to New Zealand. Hey, eat, sleep, dream English fans. This is Rosie from the YouTube channel Not Even French. Uh, I make videos about the French culture and also the Kiwi culture of the New Zealand culture as well. So, a little bit about the New Zealand accent. Couple of fun facts. So. I think a lot of people would say that the Australian accents and New Zealand accents sound very similar, but we can definitely tell the difference, kind of like uh, Canadians and Americans. To us, the Australian accent sounds a lot stronger, a bit more drawly, um, and you can definitely tell the difference when they say words like good or cool. They really tend to uh, drag out the O's a little bit. I think they tease New Zealanders a little bit about our accent because our vowels are a bit strange. So uh, if you say, for example, red, like the color, so not blue, but red, and uh, a pen, as in what you write with, and you ask your friend, hey, can I borrow your red pen? Um, to a lot of people, that would sound like uh, a red pin, you know, something you put in the wall um, to to pin a poster up or something like that. So red pin, um, fish and chips. So red pen is a classic. Another one that we get relentlessly teased about is when we say deck, as in, you know, the, the wood outside, you know, your house where you have a table and a barbecue, we would say, hey, do you wanna go outside on the deck or how's your new deck coming along? And of course that sounds a little bit like D-I-C-K. Um, so, I think, you know, our E's sound like I's and sometimes our I's can sound like U's. For example, fish and chips. I really feel like fish and chips tonight. Um, sounds a little bit like chups. <laughs> I think as well something that's interesting about the New Zealand accent is that it's pretty standard across the entire nation. It's not like, you know, in Ireland, for example, whether if you're in Cork or Limerick, you have completely different accents, right? In New Zealand, we have a very standard New Zealand accent. Uh, the only sort of tweaks to that may be in the South Island in some pockets, there's an R sound that almost rolls at the R, um, but that would be quite hard for even a New Zealander to pick up on. And then the other influence would be very rural New Zealand, um, sometimes in the farming community. The accent somehow seems a little bit stronger. It's almost verging on a, an Australian accent from the city. So a lighter Australian accent may be a kind of stronger New Zealand accent, a bit, I would call it like a blokey accent. Another influence, of course, on the New Zealand accent is Te Reo Māori, which is the Māori language from our indigenous people here in New Zealand. And that culture has influenced the way we speak every day as well. So for example, uh, they use the words cuz and bro. Um, if you were saying something is so true, you could say like hard out bro, that's so true, hard out. You know, things like that that you'd hear in New Zealand that you wouldn't hear in the UK or Australia, for example. Another example is another way of kind of saying like, oh, awesome, or whoa, would be saying, oh, too much. Like that's awesome, too much. And that comes from the Maldi culture that say too Mickey. So yeah, there's, there's little things like that as well, which are very only in New Zealand. On that point as well, the Maldi culture is coming into New Zealand English a lot more. So to say hello, you could say kia ora. And of course, Te Reo Māori is coming more and more into New Zealand English. And so just instead of saying like hello, you could say kia ora, and that would be a really normal thing to hear. Also, instead of saying well done, you might say ka pai. Instead of saying let's have a meeting, you'd say you'd have a hui. And so you'll see that more and more as well, which is very cool. Ka pai, if you will. If you wanna see me in action going through literally hundreds of slang terms unique to New Zealand, definitely check out the links down below. I'll give some videos to Tom and I hope that you enjoy them. See you later, ka kite. Cheers Rosie, great stuff. Now she's absolutely right, those vowel sounds in the New Zealand accent have always been the most distinctive to me, fush and chips. It's my terrible version of the accent. Now I personally love this accent. It's, it's so fantastic. One of my favorite films, Hunt for the Wilder People, is set in New Zealand and it displays the Kiwi accent perfectly. I, I really recommend that if you're interested in this accent and you want to hear it more, check that film out. Apparently he's a bit of a handful, real bad egg. I mean, if you look in his file, you'll see that for yourself. We're talking disobedience, stealing, spitting, running away, 
Throwing rocks, kicking stuff, defacing stuff, burning stuff, loitering and graffitiing. And that's just the stuff we know about. Anyway. Onwards to India. My name is Deepika and I'm an English teacher from India. I run the account Acquiring on Instagram and I talk about um, global English and English as a lingua franca and I bust some myths about native speakerism all while teaching you how you can acquire the best version of your existing English. And today I wanted to share a little bit about the English language the English variety in India. So English came to India in the 1600s um, through the British of course and it was around the 1830s that they started to incorporate um, English instruction in schools so it was made mandatory in some parts of the country um, for children to learn English in schools while the adults who are working in the government were um, starting to use English um, for you know day-to-day -day government activities and through that of course English spread and now in a lot of major areas in India now in 2021 um, English is a lingua franca which means that English is the language that is used as a transaction language between people who don't speak the same language. And English is also used, um, widely used as a, a, a medium of instruction in schools. And, and you might know that India is a multilingual, multicultural country and we have 22 official languages. And English is not one of them, but English is considered the associate language because it's used, like I said, as a lingua franca, not only in day-to-day -day activities, but also in government, even when it comes down to the central government interacting with the state governments, English is the one they uh, go for. Um, that being said, you might be under the impression that English is widely spoken in India. Um, I used to think that too, to be honest. I'm from India and I used to think that, but you will be surprised to know that only about 15, 1, 5, 15% of Indians speak English. Yep. And only like about 1%, so less than 1% even, speak English as a native language. So there's quite a bit of disparity between what the world thinks um, what even us Indians think and what is the reality of English in India. That said, um, in English has evolved into its own thing in India. So Indian English is a legitimate variety of the English language and it's because what is called contact linguistics. English interacting with all of the different languages in India. I said there are 22 uh, official languages there's about 700 actual languages in the country and so English interacts with many of them and forms these little um, quirks, these um, intricacies and nuances of its own kind. So Indian English is its own thing and I thought I'd share a couple of different things about uh, what makes Indian English unique and, and if you see someone out in the wild speaking English uh, I'll give you a couple of things that you can look out for um, to say if you know if you if that person is speaking Indian English so one of them is uh, let's start with vowels right one of them is how Indians say um, some of the diphthongs so diphthongs are double sound vowels and and I'm thinking of words like don't right don't do not becomes don't and the sound is o o but in most Indian English dialects now Indian English again I can't talk about it as one whole thing I can't just say all Indian in English speakers speak like this because again Indian English speakers are speakers of a variety of different languages and all of these languages influence English in different ways so these are some generic ones and there's definitely more nuanced more specific ones in different regions but this diphthong don't o um, becomes a monothong, a single word, um, a single sound. So you might hear don't. Instead of don't, you might hear don't. Or instead of a, a, the diphthong a, you might hear a, 
a uh, or a a like for example eight the past tense of eat would sound like eight uh, when in fact in other Englishes you might hear eight I ate breakfast like the number eight I ate breakfast versus in Indian English you might hear I ate breakfast you might have noticed that when some speakers of English say some sounds you can hear or feel a puff of air coming out from their mouth so uh, things like test I'm taking a test take a test test can you feel the t t so in a lot of Indian English varieties or a lot of Indian English speakers they don't make that puff of air in Indian English in a, a lot of varieties of English Indian English uh, you might hear test versus test 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 so you will feel the difference in the puff of air it's missing in a lot of Indian English varieties um, same with the the sound with P um, so if I think of pest right test pest again Pest, you might hear pest, 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 pest. These are just the tip of the iceberg, as they say. Uh, there are a lot of things influencing what kind of English people speak in India. What language you grew up speaking at home, what language uh, was spoken around you in, in the city or the town or the village you grew up in, what language was taught to you, in school whether you learn English in school or not there's a lot of not just linguistics but also politics and social class at play that determine how good your English is or what variety of Indian English you speak so hopefully that's a good summary of the Indian variety of the English language it's important for us to know that English is not one big mass right English is not a monolith English is fluid as all languages are but English ex especially is fluid and it's constantly evolving and it's used by so many people that English has as many varieties as there are speakers of English I would argue right uh, and so for us as English learners and English users it's important for us to know that English needs to be seen as that not as a monolith but as something that's constantly evolving something that um, needs to be used as something to unite us rather than to divide us so English as a lingua franca or global English is the new norm or should be the new norm um, hopefully that helps uh, enjoy your English learning journey. Thank you Deepika for dropping so much knowledge on us. Wow! I found what she said about contact linguistics fascinating. How 700 languages in India interact with English to create their own little versions. Fascinating stuff. I guess that's much like in Singapore and in other parts of the world too. Okay, let's continue our tour of English accents by going stateside. Hey everybody, my name is Teacher Will. I am from the United States of America. I grew up in a state called New Jersey. Now, within New Jersey, we have many different accents. I spent most of my life in a town called Marstown, so if you watch my content, you sometimes will hear me speak with a North Jersey accent. Now, characteristics of a North Jersey accent, for example, ah. With a Jersey accent from the North, we don't say ah, it becomes more or. So, for example, more, thought, coffee, often. And notice with the often, we pronounce the T. Another example of a Northern Jersey accent, we sometimes pronounce the R at the end of our words. As an example, care, player, where, where you going? Do you care about me? Those are characteristics that you might hear with respect to a North Jersey accent. At the end of the day, here's what I want you to re remember. Accents are the distinctive way in which you speak. And you will hear different accents around the world. Why? Because English is a global international language. Are accents important? Sure. But what's more important to me is clarity, pronunciation, enunciation, and intonation. Why do I say that? Because at the end of the day, 
regardless if you're of your accent if you're not clear and you don't pronounce words it doesn't matter what accent you have people won't understand you so if you care and you want to feel free to follow me on ask underscore teacher will hey everyone how's it going i'm leon i'm a los angeles native speaker i'm going to be talking about los angeles accent because that's where i'm from uh, of course there are 30 major dialects in the united states and uh cali you know cali representing you know what i mean repping uh we really don't pronounce the t's t's are silent so uh other states pronounce the t's uh they're both correct so for example uh mountain we say mountain or tent we say tent or that we say that or thought we say thought so this is pretty much in general uh of course there's a regular accent in cali or la then there's a surfer accent then there's a cholo or chicano or latino gangsta accent again these are all natives uh then you have the valley girl or valley accent which is kind of like a 1980s you know that's pretty much outdated uh nobody really talks like that you may find one or two people but that's pretty rare uh then there's the rapster or black african american gangster accent uh this is pretty much a brief general los angeles accent i'm sure there's others but this kind of gives you an idea in the general um as far as finding me you can find me at uh or my 411 handle is uh, english teacher leon i'm on instagram so you can find me there hopefully you like this so see y'all later ciao Hi, I'm Tanya Suarez and I'm an American business English coach and I'm here to tell you a couple of features of the American English accent. Okay, so my favorite thing to work on that I teach all the time are connected speech patterns. And there's, you know, there are a lot of different categories, but I'm going to teach you a few today that will help you not only recognize the American accent, but also speak American English in a way that's a lot more natural and fluid. Okay, so the first thing is linking and blending. I love these. So for linking, this is part of connected speech where you take the, for example, a consonant and a vowel. You take, if a word ends in a consonant and the next word begins with a vowel, you link the sound. I'll be honest, this basically means like you don't really pause in between them, but then there's also a rhythm that links it. For example, we need to pitch it to the client tomorrow. So we have pitch that ends in ch, the ch sound, and it that starts with the i vowel sound. So instead of we need to pitch it, you're not going to finish that air at the end of pitch. You're going to connect the ch to the i, chit. So we need to pitch it, pitch it to the client tomorrow. So this is where an entire like pause is reduced and it also changes your intonation because you're linking it. So instead of just pitch, it's pitch it, pitch it. Another example would be, how are you feeling about the merger? So how are, which this is great. For example, how are you? So how are, we end how with the w consonant sound and then we start it with R with the A vowel sound so you know that you can link it. So how are, war, instead of how, are, how are how are you feeling how are you feeling about the merger so these are moments where linking really helps you feel like your english is smoother if you're learning the american accent and if not it helps you at least with comprehension and with your listening thank you so much for being interested in the american accent and i hope that these tips help you feel more confident and comfortable with americans Thank you, Teacher Will, Leon, and Tanya for your great insights into American English accents. And as they said, there are so many American English accents, we couldn't possibly do them all justice here. So perhaps, if you're up for it, we should do a part two. Hello, my name is Chloe, and I am from South Africa, and I'm going to be talking to you today a little bit about the South African accent. <laughs> so there's a couple of points of context that I have to give before I can talk about any examples of features from the South African accent. And the first thing is that um, South Africa is a country with a complex history, a lot of different kinds of people, uh, and 11 official languages uh, official, and many more are spoken. So it is a very rich area linguistically. Um, and what it means is that to say someone has a South African accent, you're really only referring to 
one kind of thing. The same way if you said someone has an American accent, well, which kind? From which state? Are they from Boston? Are they from the South? The same way in England, if you say they have a British accent or an English accent, where are they from? Are they from the North? Are they from the South? And it's very much the same in South Africa, except that there are a couple more variables, I would say. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of accents in South Africa that range depending on race, on class, on geographical location, on culture, and so many other different things. And what comes along with that is due to South Africa's difficult history, um, the effects of that leak into every aspect of life in South Africa and language is no exception. So um, certain accents in South Africa are held in more prestige and are viewed as being more formal or just better in general, um, where certain other aspects are associated with all kinds of terrible things, lower intelligence, all kinds of terrible things. And obviously, generally, it is the white dialects that um, are seen with prestige very generally speaking. Um, and those are just important factors to take into account when we're talking about the South African accent. So when you're studying linguistics, uh, generally you deal with the um, general South African English accent. That's what it's called, Gen SAE, Gen Se, as I say, I don't know. And so let's talk about a couple of features. Um, one very important feature that comes up a lot is um, the schwa vowel, so that is the uh sound, uh, uh, uh. Uh, We use it in place of the rhotic R at the end of a word, like in shorter, father, butter, we would say shorter, father, butter. And that uh, uh, uh sound at the end is the schwa. It also comes up in kind of all over the place. It's a very um, noticeable feature of the South African accent. Oh, by the way, I, I get told every day, all day long, that I have a weird accent for a South African. Uh, there's not a day I don't have to um, explain to someone where I'm from, no, where are you really from, no, where are your grandparents from. I have a, I have a bit of an atypical accent, uh, probably because I'm a neurodivergent person with a neurodivergent accent. Um, so please don't base your uh, knowledge or assumptions on the accent on me. <laughs> Moving on to another feature, which is monophthongization monophthongization <laughs> i don't think i'm saying that right but it is turning diphthongs into monophthongs once again this is only an example of a feature that could come up in certain dialects in certain accents um in south africa so an example of that would be like um in the word pie there is a diphthong where you slide from i you feel the vowel move, uh, whereas in certain South African dialects, you would just say pa. I'd lock a pa. <laughs> um, there's two for you right in there. Uh, another one, another feature, uh, and this is related to, you know, the existence of so many different uh, accents and people groups and stuff like that in South Africa. So something related to that is if you were to ask a Iskosa speaking person, to pronounce the words bed, bird, and bad, they would say all three words the same way, uh, bed, bed, and bed. And the reason for that is that in the Isklosa language, and I think quite a few others in South Africa, there are only five vowels that are used, and they're all short vowels, a, e, i, o, u, and so they don't use long vowels um, or I believe diphthongs or anything like that. And the unfortunate side effect of that is that once again, certain accents are looked down upon in South Africa and that is something that someone might be made fun of or um, have assumptions made about them. And this is just a reminder that just because someone doesn't say a word the same way that you do doesn't mean that they are less intelligent or that they are their you know, words are worthless. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. I hope that I've taught you something or that you found something interesting or that I made you curious to find out a little bit more. Anyway, have a nice day. Thank you so much, Chloe, for your analysis of South African English. Now, I was really interested to hear her speak about the social factors that play into accents and how some accents can be seen positively or negatively 
It's a sad reality that we have to acknowledge and it's certainly true in British English accents where some accents have higher status and some are perceived to have lower status. But I guess that's a video for another time which we can explore in greater depth. Hi everyone, David here from speaklikedavid.com and I'm gonna be answering the question, where's your accent from? It's kind of complicated because I'm actually not a native English speaker so I can't just say, oh, it's American or British or it's from this particular town or part of countries like that. Um, I'm actually Indian, um, but I was not born in India. I was born and raised in Brunei. That's a tiny country in Southeast Asia. But I don't have an Indian accent. I don't have a Brunei accent either. Um, and that goes back to how I actually learned English. From a very young age, I was immersed into the English language through TV shows. And I'm talking about shows like Sesame Street, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Bugs Bunny and the Looney Tunes, um, Dexter's Laboratory, Johnny Bravo, shows like that. And all the main characters in, in all of my favorite childhood TV shows were North American characters. They had you know, different accents from various parts of North America. And that ended up being the strongest influence that I had. Um, these were my role models when it came to how to communicate in English. And so I ended up picking up a lot of the way they spoke. Now, I don't have what can strictly be called an American or, or Canadian accent um, because the education system in Brunei um, teaches British English. Brunei is a Commonwealth country. And so I spell words the British way. I write color with a U. Um, I use words like rubbish and I still pronounce aluminium the right way um, as aluminium and not aluminum. So it's probably most accurate to say that I have an international accent uh, because it is in fact the product of a whole range of different influences from across the globe. Thank you, David. I love that we're ending on internationalized English accents because I think they are so rarely talked about in course books and in language classes, but they are so common. When I lived in Hong Kong, I had lots of friends who had a kind of international English accent because they had myriad influences on their English. The TV they watched, the social media they consumed, their parents' mother tongues, uh, their friends, the schools they went to, they had so many influences on their accents that they picked up pronunciation features from different places and had these kind of international accents. Perhaps your accent is like David's and you've collected influences from lots of different places. I would love you to leave me a comment below this video and share your story. If you would like to learn all about British English accents, you can click on this video here. And if you wanna know what accents all the England football players have, click on this video here and I'll see you there.